Welcome to MYs. You're in the intelligence track, and today we'll be having um, Emily Ferguson and Trey Hurd speak. Round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Cycle of Crime, Cyber Scams, and Civil War, Lessons from Myanmar. My name is Emily Ferguson. With me today is Trey Hare. And this is, presentation is based off an upcoming report that myself and Emma Schroeder wrote. Unfortunately, Emma's sick and can't be with us today. For many theorists, there's a large divide between cyber and conflict. This leads to a persistent belief that cybercrime can't have real world impact or drive the decision making of a state. The actions of cyber criminals in Myanmar push against these assumptions. Our research has been at the nexus between cybercrime and conflict to provide insight to policymakers and industry. Challenging these assumptions and giving practitioners a dangerous cycle to look for in at-risk regions or states. Now, I will note that we're using Myanmar today and not Burma. The Hunter renamed it in 1989 to Myanmar from Burma, which is also the name of a major ethnic group in the area. The UN and State Department recognize either, and some democracy groups prefer Burma. We recognize the history of the name, and for simplicity's sake, we're going to be using Myanmar's today. As we begin, I would like to share three stories with you. The first story is about a woman named ML from New York City. In 2021, she began online dating using social media. She quickly matched and found an interesting individual that she began chatting with every day. He would often send her messages of good morning, good evening, and they chatted about their interests and families. He had a particular interest in cryptocurrency investing. Several months later, she filed a FBI report after losing $102,000. In a statement to the Global Anti-Scam Organization, she said she works in tech and she really should have known better than to download and use an app that wasn't available on the app store. But she felt like cryptocurrency was her blind spot and she wasn't sure what was normal and not. Our second story is about an unnamed victim who we're just going to call Bob. Bob, in 2022, traveled from um, Malaysia to Bangkok, Thailand for a new job. He was very excited and considered this new job to be the start of a new life for him. Once he arrived in Thailand, he was forced into a van, his passport was stolen, and he was driven several hours to the Myanmar-Thailand border where he was smuggled across at night. Once in Myanmar, he was forced to scam victims from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. daily. And if he did not meet his quotas, he would be threatened with beatings. Bob was told that if he ever wanted to leave the scam compound and return home, he needed to either earn the equivalent of 103,000 US dollars, or his family had to pay a high ransom, which they could not afford. Our third story is about Mao Kunthit and Al Min Kant. Both of them were 18 when they died fighting the Hunta forces. In a small town in the Karen state of Myanmar, the fighting started at 2 a.m. and went until 6 p.m., with the Hunta forces bombing the small town over 20 times with fighter jets and launching artillery into the town. This town had previously been a considered a safe haven for activists and individuals fleeing the conflict in other zones. These three true stories that I just shared with you are part of the cycle of crime, cyber scams, and civil war in Myanmar, illustrating the connectivity between cyber criminal activities and armed conflict. Today, we're going to dig deep and explore how instability nurtures organized crime and how cybercrime has become a vehicle to fund conflict. Here we see the cybercrime conflict cycle. In the Myanmar context, we've seen that this cycle of instability, meaning long-standing characteristics and recent shocks, 
have forced criminals and armed combatants to adapt. Because the adaptation is so effective, the new relationships and practices are entrenched. Because the actors involved are so benefit so much from this cycle, they themselves preserve and perpetuate the instability. In Myanmar, this creates significant financial costs to victims around the world. It sows instability across Southeast Asia, and it exacerbates the violence in the Myanmar Civil War. Additionally, this introduced the risk that this model can be adapted and evolved elsewhere. This model also challenges the assumptions of the strong divide between crime and conflict, demonstrating that illicit actions can flow across all domains and they can flow and feed each other without proper guardrails in place. Mm -hmm. Awesome, so let's take a step back for a second. Yeah. Myanmar's created in 1948. Burma separates from the British Empire, declares its independence. It's the first time it's an independent state. The 1962 elections turn into a sort of overwhelming military coup. The, the junta that takes power in 62 doesn't really effectively give up power until 2015. The 70s and the 80s see significant economic deterioration, the growth of this massive illicit economy, especially in border regions with China, start to see significant drug tracking, and there is a certain amount of kidnapping and localized violence that starts to perpetuate across the country. The junta evolves several times during this period. It declares that in 1988, in response to massive protests across the country, it's gonna hold popular elections in 1990. Those elections never happen in any legitimate way. The junta continues through power until 2015, when a second set of popular elections bring a democratically elected government into power. 2015 to 2020, that government rules starts to push back on some of the criminality that's evolved in this illicit economy across the country. 2020, there's another popular election. The Hunter's preferred party loses badly. They declare the results illegitimate, and Feb 21 resume power. A coup deposes the existing elected government, and the top Madaw, the uh, Myanmar's military, takes power. Why does this matter for us as we're thinking through this problem? Since February 2021, U.S. Institute of Peace and Human Rights Watch speculate between three and 5,000 civilians have been killed. This is the last two years, and more than a million have been displaced. The civil war that was exacerbated and restarted by this coup has been funded and supported by a series of these overlaps between the illicit economy and the military. It's a fragmented, conflicting landscape. The deposed government, the NUP, and the Tat Madaw are working in conjunction with an array of ethnic armed groups spread across the country in a series of shifting alliances and alignments. Keeping those alliances firm requires not just some sort of political cohesion, but funding support, economic discipline, and military gains. The Tat Madaw has suffered significantly losing territory since the Feb 21 coup. So they're in a disadvantageous position as COVID-19 rolls in. This is the, dis the situation of the disposition in February 22. This is a year after the coup. Each of these different colored regions is sort of owned or authoritatively asserted by a different ethnic armed group. So it's highly fragmented control across the country. Myanmar, since 48, has been running through these cycles of instability decades prior to the current outbreak. It's fertile ground for some kind of opportunistic innovation in the way that people think about funding and supporting conflict. Three really critical precipitating conditions. The first is weak rule of law. That emergence in the 70s and 80s of those drug trafficking networks that allows the passage of goods, brings in revenue across the border, reduces central government control over these regions. There is a series of ceasefires in the 1990s, after those widespread protests in 88 I talked about, that helps fuel significant acceleration in those illicit earnings and actually brings in investment from the central state. That investment, in many cases, is captured by these criminal groups, especially in border regions through casinos, outright theft, fraud, and extortion. The relative peace of the 90s facilitates this sort of change in corruption away from direct criminality into extracting resources from the state. So this is thing one, weak rule of law. Second condition is the presence and the maturity of organized crime networks. The groups that thrive in this country, and especially in regions like Karen State, on the border with China, create overwhelming syndicates, local political authorities sort of asserting their own power in conjunction with the state. It's not unique to the Karen state. Myanmar, ranked by the Global Organized Crime Index, it's a, built, it's a Swiss nonprofit based in Geneva, ranks Myanmar third in the world and the first in Asia in terms of organized criminality. 
So there's a widespread issue. In the Karen state, a group called the Border Guard Force, which M and Emily's project focuses on, grows to become this sort of proto-political power in the area. The Border Guard Force is actually under investigation by the government elected in 2015 up until the coup in 21. It's considering abrogating a ceasefire it has with that government because the investigation appears like it's going to bear fruit. It's going to start to assert state control over Karen and challenge the Border Guard Force. So we have now this second precipitating condition, the growth of organized crime. The third is the active ongoing cycle of violence. Conflict provides a measure of independence and protection for these groups. It allows them to assert political control over areas, challenging the state without having to, to challenge the state's existential status. Right? I can push back on you in a region without challenging your right to exist completely. The conflict gives them the ability to do this. Human trafficking, drug running become an effective means of supporting those activities. Again, a condition that's not unique to Myanmar. So we've got these three precipitating conditions, weak rule of law, the presence and maturity of organized crime, and an active ongoing conflict. Into this, we introduce the significant accelerant to regional cybercrime that is the effects of COVID-19. So with these precipitating conditions, we see that active conflict, organized crime, and weak rule of law really are the circulating conditions that the COVID-19 accelerant uh, provides the impetus for crime groups to expand their operations rapidly. When we talk about criminal adaptation, we're really talking about in the Myanmar context, strong illicit markets, co-opted economic development, and then the catalyst of the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns disrupting the market, and massive unemployment and migration. So turning to the illicit markets in Myanmar, Again, illicit markets in Myanmar are not a new thing. There's a strong history of drug trafficking, drug production, and these market profits are directly being used by EAOs to allow them to challenge government control. In some areas, the illicit markets are so large and productive that they dwarf the formal economies. This means that there's little incentive for officials to crack down without explicit permission from not just the Myanmar government, but the EAOs that control that market as well. When we talk about co-opted economic development, what we mean is criminal networks using economic development efforts for their own purposes. This is especially seen in the special economic zones that are spread across Southeast Asia. Special economic zones, or SESs, have become hotbeds of lawlessness. The one SES in particular we're talking about today is called Shwe Koko. And it is when the Google Earth photo will show you, it's located in the Karen state along the border with Thailand. Now, Shwe Koko was originally intended to be Myanmar's Silicon Valley, but now it is the center of legal and illegal gambling centers. It has illicit trade and now these scam compounds. As we dig further into Shwe Koko, we should note that it is also the home of the Karen Border Guard Force headquarters and the Shwe Koko Special Economic Zone was specifically developed in partnership with Chitlin Myang Co Limited. This is a company that has strong ties with the BGF leadership. Even before the coup, the government was investigating the ties between the BGF and criminal activity in Shwe Koko, but this investigation was closed after the coup. When we talk about the COVID shock to this area, we really saw that immediately after COVID-19, uh, it changed the economic situation entirely. The SESs in this area relied primarily on tourist income coming to these zones to gamble and engage in these illicit markets. But with COVID-19 lockdowns, there were no more tourists and no more profits for criminal groups or operating them. The criminal groups looked around to potential new profit sources and adapted. They used their connections with human trafficking networks to work with a new victim pool. This leads us to the kidnap to scam pipeline. Now, cybercrime has existed in Southeast Asia for long before these scams have existed. And in fact, the pig butchering scam we're going to talk about today originally started in China in 2019. But the COVID shock allowed increased viability. And these criminal groups were able to adapt and scale the scam rapidly, mainly because it's not technically sophisticated. And really, they only needed a dedicated labor force, which the human trafficking networks were able to provide. 
So there's a three-step chain in this kidnap to scam pipeline. The first step is fraudulent job advertisements. The second is human trafficking networks. And the third is scam compounds themselves. So the first link of the fake job advertisements, these can be found on legitimate, widely used sites. And they are often for IT administrative sales and, and other white collar positions. These jobs promise good salaries and typically target mid 20s to 30s white collar workers in Southeast Asia. This is a demographic that was hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 unemployment waves. The second link is the human trafficking networks. These networks would ferry unsuspecting job seekers from their initial point where they thought they would be employed to the scam compounds themselves. Once, they are in the once they were with these uh, human trafficking networks, the job seekers' passports would be confiscated from them. And the process towards the scam compounds was intentionally confusing, often multiple hours of car rides through uh, really dense jungles. And they were forced to cross international borders at night. The third link is the scam compounds themselves. Often these compounds are repurposed hotels or casinos in these special economic zones. They just added barbed wire and armed guards. The job seekers would be delivered to the scam compounds and told that their new job was to run these scams as a keyboarder. The keyboarder plays a very important role in these scams because they are the person who is initially contacting all these victims, running these social media profiles, and they're uh, given the task of building seemingly legitimate relationships with potential victims. If keyboarders do not meet their quotas, they face severe punishments, including beatings, threatening their families. They can be denied food and water or locked in dark rooms for multiple, multiple hours or days. And this can even lead to some of the keyboarders committing suicide or uh, unfortunately passing away. This kidnap to scam pipeline is really different in two ways. It reverses the direction of the human trafficking flows in Southeast Asia. Typically, human trafficking flows in Southeast Asia bring people out, but this is bringing people in. And second, there's a change in the victim type. It's very rare to see white collar workers who are being targeted by human trafficking networks. And white collar workers are unfortunately very unprepared for this. They lack most of the vetting skills that other individuals who've been tra uh, targeted previously have. The UN estimates that over 120,000 people have been held in scam compounds in Myanmar alone. An escape victim testimony reports that these compounds can hold hundreds or thousands of keyboarders. Now we're gonna talk about the scam itself that most of these individuals are running. As I said earlier, it's called pig butchering or Sha Pan. It combines elements of both investment and relationship scams, and it's unfortunately highly effective. Victims of this scam lose more on average than any other scam. This also has three stages. The first stage is the hook, the second is the fattening, and the third is the slaughter. The hook stage begins with a multitude of social media uh, or chat application profiles. The keyboarder will appear, will contact potential victims, often with a simple hello or pretending to be a business contact or old friend. These profiles will often be of a wealthy or attractive individual. The second stage is the fattening. And this is the relationship building stage in which the keyboarder will build a relationship, either romantic or platonic in nature, with the potential victim. They will spend hours chatting and providing uh, information about a fake life that's been crafted, specifically for these victims. During this stage, they will introduce cryptocurrency investing and often introduce a fake application or platform or website that will appear to be a legitimate cryptocurrency investing platform, but it is not. Once the potential victim agrees to start using cryptocurrency investing, that is when the slaughter stage begins. 
Unfortunately, as soon as the potential victim starts to send money on this fake platform, it goes immediately into the hands of the criminal organizations. They often start small at first, you know, maybe a couple hundred dollars, maybe a thousand dollars, and the, on the uh, fake platform, the account will always grow. This will encourage the victim to continue to invest. And the scammers and keyboarders will push using social engineering tactics and the information gained during the relationship building stage to encourage that person to invest more and more, showing them how many returns they've gotten. Once the victim is completely maxed out, they're suddenly cut off from the app or platform and ghosted on social media. This can be especially traumatic to the victim because they thought that they had a legitimate relationship with the scammer. A global anti-scam organization study of 550 pig butchering victims found that 75% of their victims lost more than half of their net worth. And 33% were in debt from this scam. In this section, we're going to talk about entrenchment and specifically the global financial impact, the regional criminal resilience of this scam, and how it perpetuates violence. When we're looking at the global financial impact, again, these scams really are not technically sophisticated. They don't need a huge tech investment. And they yet, they realize massive gross and net profits. And unfortunately, we do not have a very clear Co uh, cost of the pig butchering scam specifically because the IC3 only categorizes it as a general scam. But in 2021, the IC3 did report that they had received over 4,325 4, complaints, totaling over 429 million. If we look to similar scams being run out of Cambodia, a 2022 Vice study showed that those scams in Cambodia alone raked in over a billion US dollars every year. We really do need more research and quantitative research on the cost of this scam, specifically in three time periods, from before COVID, from 2020 to the 2021 coup, and then from the 2021 coup until now. This would allow us to quantitatively demonstrate how the shocks of, to the Myanmar population and the criminals impact operations. Looking towards the regional instability, the majority of the kidnapped to scam victims are from neighboring Southeast Asian countries, but some victims are from as far away as South America and Africa. This leads to increased tension with neighbors as countries are forced to rescue their own citizens from these compounds. These criminal organizations remain highly adaptive and highly responsive to law enforcement pressure. In 2022, Cambodia cracked down on similar scams run out of Sahanukville. What groups on the ground saw was that these scam organizations did not fold under law enforcement pressure. They simply picked up and moved to other locations. This really highlights the need for concentrated regional efforts to counter these groups and prevent them from entrenching in safe havens like in the Karen state of Myanmar. Thanks so much. Last piece is the way it perpetuates civil conflict, civil war. The 21 coup is a boon for the border guard force in Karen state, right? It ends that investigation the government that was elected in 2015 had begun into their finances and the behavior in these casinos. And as the casinos resume operating the Shwikoko in this special economic zone, right, the top Madal is able to harvest some of those resources for their own purposes. Now, the coup in 21 does not go unnoticed in the rest of the world. And there's a significant effort by some states, including the US, to sanction the Tat Madal, to try to cut off their access to finances, finances that they're using to purchase arms from the Russian and Chinese governments, less so the Russians now, given their constraints in the conflict in Ukraine. But the Tat Madal is able to work with the border guard force to harvest resources from these pig butchering scams on the order of tens of millions of dollars to continue to sustain themselves and fund those military operations and those munitions purchases. It allows both the BGF and the Tat Madaw working together to withstand external shocks and policy intervention. It creates an intrinsic source of support for their activities in the region. 
So this entrenchment, the concern that we're trying to raise is that this is a highly adoptable model. There's very little of this that's unique to Myanmar. It has some significant presence of the three major precipitating conditions, but very few of them are unique to the region. This idea of weak rule of law, organ presence of organized crime and active conflict are present in other places. Right? There is questions about West Africa, Venezuela, and the Balkan Peninsula that share some of these same warning flags. And in fact, Interpol called out these trends in a report just in June 2023 looking at West Africa where, quote, cyber-enabled financial crime is already prevalent. These operations are rarely confined to one locale, but they spread across these regional criminal networks. And Kidnap to Scan in Myanmar illustrates how cybercrime can, show, can sow physical and political instability. These tactics lead to the potential for a self-reinforcing cycle of instability. If I can keep a war going, I can keep that profit engine turning. I don't have to worry about that turning off. I don't have to find an alternative source of revenue. So where do we come from? This team from the Atlantic Council, a foreign policy think tank based here in the States, the cyber team, why are we talking about cybercrime in Myanmar? The first is just the novelty of this particular tactic being linked to ongoing armed conflict. Right? Crime doesn't end at Bitcoin. And it's significant, it never has, but it's significant that we're tying it here to illustrate both human and strategic impact in the region. It's much more wide than previously thought. If I'm a cyber crime analyst, why do I care about this? I have causes and incentives to adapt criminality and my particular tactics that exist outside the economic model of the crime itself. If I care about armed groups and conflict, why am I interested in this? We have a whole new revenue stream that is sustaining armed conflict in this particular region. And if I am just a geopolitical analyst, I care about international security and politics, why am I interested? Why am I at this talk? This is an effective means to sustain violence and to link that violence to activities outside of a region. The cybercrime value chain becomes a transmission mechanism, not just for violence in a region, but for physical and human impact outside. What Emily talks about in terms of reversing the human trafficking cycle that is connecting regionalized violence with the potential for global instability. It underlines the importance of communication and collaboration in the region, but it also highlights some issues for the technology community and the cyber criminal community to be thinking about. Because both ends of, these value chain, of this value chain exist in some cases on the same platform without being overtly connected on that platform. So it requires us to think a little bit differently about the telemetry that we see from activities around recruitment, around the potential for fraud and extortion, separate from these job recruiting ads, actually trying to cause not just the shift of financial resources, but of people, right, to drive that trafficking scheme. Conflict and the vulnerability of people, especially non-combatants, are timeless. That's not a new phenomenon by any stretch of the imagination. What we have here is an ugly and very efficiently new transmission mechanism to take those people and use them to fuel violence and conflict. That's our principal concern. We didn't talk a lot about recommendations just in the time we allotted to the presentation, so happy to talk about that when we take Q&A. But other than that, a big congratulations to Emily and to Emma for this work. Thank you all very much for your time. We're happy to take your questions. <laughs> nice job. Thank you very much for that presentation. So um, Arc Business spends a good deal of effort collecting information about uh, fraudulent job opportunities that are offered on our behalf and we end up going and taking down what type of telemetry would be best to be able to track these types of networks and be able to affect them in more efficient ways? So I'm curious Emily's answers, but I think just two things quickly. I mean, one is looking at regional clusters of job ads relative to ongoing violence, right? So rather than just job ads as a global scourge where there's this effort to pull them into a protected region, right? We, Emily talked about those, those physical sites being places where these scams can operate. They are protected from international legal intervention in those environments, right? literally armed forces. So that's one question I would be looking at is the clustering of those ads. But the second is the time sequencing. If you're seeing ads targeting similar populations, users, as these financial crime, these extortion techniques are targeting, that's indicative of a different kind of trend than just these traditional job ads you're talking about. I'm curious. And from the content of the ad itself, we've seen that majority of these ads typically have higher than average salary advertisements. There are other trends as well in the content, looking specifically at promising luxurious accommodations, having meals provided. You know, sometimes you can see these services being offered in legitimate ads, but by and large, it tends to be uh, questionable, I'll say.
All right, so with regards to this becoming sort of a self-propagating cycle, uh, sort of a two-part thing. So the first is, is it fair to say that in, in more economically depressed areas or other areas that you've seen these scams go on, that the illicit economy is beginning to replace a legitimate sort of national economy? Um, and if so, do sanctions then just actually keep propagating things, right? Because you can't just forklift an economy or a forklift upgrade one. Um, so just wondering what you think about that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it would seem that since the individuals who are running the scam and perpetuating the scam are not sanctioned uh, individuals, it, it seems like sanctions really don't impact them at all. And when it, I'm sorry, the first part of your question was again, that it's replacing the markets that are there. Yes, so in some of these areas, uh, the illegitimate market of drug trafficking and drug production was already there. This simply just kind of co-opted it. Or maybe there was illegal gambling, casinos, that kind of thing. And this really switch, flipped the switch in these economies from, oh, this method of illegal market to this method of illegal market. Yeah, so I, I think the two other things I'd add are it's generally true that illicit economies are more resistant to formal tools like sanctions. And we saw that in Lebanon in the 80s. We've seen it throughout history across different regions. What I think is interesting from this point to your question is that weak rule of law combined with criminality, like these are com precipitating conditions together. So the absence of a formal economy isn't necessarily enough to drive that. It's the opportunity to take advantage of it. The other piece of this, though, I think, to your question is, in terms of how we're seeing broader trends, the way we talk about economic value for this particular scam means that a broad illicit economy actually works against the trend. So this is being embedded inside of a, a fairly mobile network of countries in a region where it's easy to get cross borders, where there are white collar jobs available, where there effectively is a target population for the scam. If the requirement was to be bringing, translating these folks through a, a human trafficking pipeline that was global in nature, it'd be easier for us to stymie if there were larger borders or different trans mechanism, transmission mechanisms like planes, right? It would be easy to stymie, easier to stymie some of those flows. So I think that's part of why we called out those particular regions, Venezuela, West Africa, and the Balkan Peninsula, is because they're areas where this, these precipitating conditions exist inside of a broader healthy economy or at least more formal economy. So I think there's a relationship there that's really interesting to try to unpack, and again, deserves some additional research. Yeah, of course, thank you. Questions from others? Next question, just raise your hand, I'll come over to you. So Thailand isn't exactly known as a bastion of democracy, even though they keep trying. How, what's the relationship with Thailand being on the border of of Myanmar, and you know, is there a somewhat symbiotic relationship to the royal slash junta that somewhat rules Thailand versus uh, the Myanmar? So why not break down more on on that side? Yeah, so Thailand's pretty tricky in the fact that there are some benefits to Thailand, specifically in the economic side. Uh, what we've seen in Shwe Koko specifically is, because it lies right on the border, um, Thailand cellular infrastructure has actually built up significantly along that border in order to provide services to Shwe Koko. So we see a, a definite economic benefit in these border areas, which most of these border areas don't have a very strong economy to begin with. Um, as far as political ties, it has definitely been difficult to watch uh, the Myanmar and Thailand dance as they try to especially repatriate some of these uh, individuals that are Thai citizens back from these compounds. Uh, it's definitely, I would characterize it more as embarrassing for the Thai politicians rather than damaging. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions from folks? And I'm going to look to the right and not call on the mids to my left, who I know are going to get asked by their advisors what they asked in the panel discussion this morning. <laughs> right here in the front. Hi. 
Hi. So from like an infrastructure standpoint, like the domains and the apps that these actors use, or even like the job ads that they, you know, have on the internet, do you have like an intelligence sharing relationship? Like, are they posting on LinkedIn and you give LinkedIn like, hey, this particular company is associated with this pig butchering scam in, you know, Myanmar, or, you know, we know that this particular domain is used to send to victims and, you know, what's the intelligence sharing relationship? Um, so the state of California has actually done a really good job in this. They have a very active website where any uh, application or website that's flagged as being part of a scam and pig butchering scams in particular, uh, they get posted on this website that's a repository. So individuals who are maybe skeptical of what they're about, you know, what platform they're about to use to invest in can just double check using this California website to see if this actually is a known scam website. Um, and in California in particular, there's a prosecutor uh, in the Santa Clara County called Erin West. She has been the head of trying to get more intelligence sharing for pig butchering scams in particular. She's been somewhat successful, uh, but there tends to be a reticence with intelligence sharing um, and especially making it easier for um, fake job advertisements and fake platforms to be flagged as such. Yeah, and then anything in terms of what the council is doing specifically, we'd have to talk about offline. Question from down here. So, thank you very much. Coming up. <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation. You know, it's been really insightful. We've talked a lot about defensive and defensive measures that can be taken and, and the exact situation that's been going on. Are there any, for lack of a better term, offensive or proactive things that the United States or companies in the United States can do to help mitigate this situation and, and prevent it from occurring in other places? Yeah, so kind of what Trey had um, alluded to earlier, social media companies, especially ones based in the US, um, are overwhelmingly present in this chain, either as the hosts of fake job advertisements or the social media accounts that are being used. So this really is an opportunity for US government and private companies here in the US to cooperate and coordinate efforts, make it easier to flag these accounts, you know, use their to entire tools in their repertoire to make sure that they're identifying, flagging, and taking down these accounts before they contact victims and start this cycle. I think the other piece to your question, though, is there's a significant regional dimension to this. So let's take just DOD's role for a second. Right? The COCOMs have an interest in instability and armed conflict in their regions, and there's a desire to understand both participants' activities, but also the source of the power, the influence, and the motivation for those activities. So if I am AFRICOM, for example, and I'm looking at this trend coming out of Southeast Asia, I would want to start to track or be engaging with folks in the FBI, folks at Secret Service, and Interpol that are thinking about cybercrime inside the crime box, because I see that it's breaking out of that box and it has an impact on my AO. For what we're talking about in terms of proactive activities, you know, this is an area where the US has sometimes struggled, right? We're thinking about the war in Afghanistan and the significant influence of the opium trade and sustaining parts of that conflict and some significant actors in that conflict over 20 years. That was an under-addressed part of US policy. So for something like this, the intelligence understanding of the criminal networks, not usually thought of as a, as a military focus or even an offensive activity, is something that can provide insight, I think, and, and forewarning in some cases. The other thing I would be thinking about here, and it comes back to the gentleman's question around mechanisms to actually block this trade in transit, is what are the partnerships, the, the sort of operational collaboration you're gonna hear a lot about, public-private partnership you're gonna hear a lot about over the next three days, what are those manifesting as? Shields Up produced a really positive response in the private sector from a cybersecurity standpoint that was very focused on critical infrastructure protection, was very focused on defensive policy. Where can we expand that model and those kinds of relationships to address this kind of value chain that's transcending just the criminal space, right? It's implications outside of that. I think part of the challenge here is just a scope question, right? How do we think about what it is that we're interested and curious about? So I think to your question, a lot of the same relationships, but probably having slightly different conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for one or two more. We have a hand here. Yes, your hand. <laughs> and thank you very much for the Mike Runners and the organizers here. I know this is tough, a tough three days. Thank you so much. 
Um, hi. Being uh, from the Balkans myself, I'm quite curious. Um, what are some of the peculiarities of the groups operating in the Balkans and what can the governments there who are friendly to the US do to help mitigate the situation? Yeah. Hi, Robert. Nice to see you. Hello. <laughs> um, so when we looked at the Balkan Peninsula, uh, we didn't see, necessarily see signs of this pig butchering scam and this kidnap to scam pipeline existing. However, we do know in the Balkan Peninsula there is an extremely tech savvy workforce. It's a very smart, hardworking people who have access to great technology. And because of that, they already have infrastructure that they need to do just about any kind of cyber scam that they would want. Additionally, we're seeing, we're, we're tracking the economic squeeze of COVID-19 in that area. It may not have impacted in the exact same way as it did in Myanmar, but that's just due to different precipitating conditions. And third, there is no active conflict currently in the Balkan Peninsula. However, that doesn't mean that in the next five, 10 years that will not change, fingers crossed. Um, but you know, it's definitely something to be very aware of, and it's more of a warning sign, hey, make sure everyone is looking in the same direction rather than, oh, it'll never happen here. It's a good point just to add to Emily's answer. What we haven't seen outside of the region yet is the use of this activity to build a war chest prior to conflict, right? Which would be an interesting extension of the thesis and one that you could do within an area of sufficient lack of rule of law without necessarily armed conflict ongoing. Um, at a lower scale. And so I think that's, a, that's an interesting problem I have to think through after this. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Appreciate the question. Awesome. Any last questions from this group? Awesome. We all have a lot to get to in the next couple of days. So big thank you to the organizing team. A big thank you to Emily and Emma for doing this work. One more round of applause if you guys wouldn't mind to join with them. Thank you everyone for being here today. Thanks for listening to us and I hope you have an excellent day. Take care. <laughs>